Amen. And good evening, everybody. The Sabbath is coming close, and we are going to be going through the final presentation on unlocking prophecy. <clears throat> so this is the final night of unlocking prophecy, and before we start, we will begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can come to you and we can ask you for guidance, that we approach you in faith, that you will lead us into all truth. We thank you for your word, for your revealing that you have given to us, the prophecies that we can know that your Bible is true and accurate. We ask for your wisdom now as we open your word and as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. So a little bit of a review of last evening's presentation. So we talked about William Miller's rules. He had 14 rules. Really, there was 13 Bible study principles, but the 14th was that we need to have faith. Then we talked about the seven trumpets, and we found out that these are plagues on the papacy. That in Joel, there is four kinds of locusts, and there was four descendants of people that, were, that lived in the east. The Sabians the Dedanims, the children of Kedar, and the Arabians from the wilderness. And then we've seen that Ellen White confirms that the Turkish invasions were the fifth and sixth trumpet, according to great controversy. And what's interesting is <coughs> great controversy is read by almost all Adventists, and somehow we still miss this very important part in the great controversy. And the other evening, I realized that I missed a couple verses. Uh, we were going through a lot of material on Kedar, specify, specifying that he was from the East also. We read that he was a descendant of Ishmael, but then uh, I neglected two verses. One is from Jeremiah 49, verse 28, and it says, concerning Kedar, and concerning the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, shall smite, thus saith the Lord, Arise ye, go up to Kedar, and spoil the men of the east. Then we have Ezekiel 27, verse 21. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee in lambs and rams and goats, and in these were they thy merchants." So these verses just are going through and uh, clarifying that Kedar was as well from the east. Then we've seen that Ellen White in Great Controversy confirmed this, and I'll just read the highlights here. 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy, which was purely a matter of calculation on prophetic periods of Scripture. The Turkish government would surrender its independence on the 11th day of August, 1840. So, confirming that this was an actual fulfillment of Revelation 9. Now we come to the topic for this evening, which is a very contended topic. Now, when we're talking about Revelation 9, backtracking a little bit, why does this actually matter? Why does it matter that Revelation 9 is talking about this versus that or something else? Because you could say, well, it, it doesn't really affect me. You know, that was something, regardless, that happened a while ago. Uh, it doesn't change anything for me. But one thing we have to realize is that it does change a lot. Number one, Islam 
was a protection for God's people. And how was that? Well, when we look in history, the papal reign, when the papacy would begin to rise, and this is for all the trumpets, not only the fifth and the sixth, but all the trumpets, as the papacy would gain power, then this other power would come up and start warring against the papacy to bring it down, that it couldn't totally annihilate God's people. So it, as the papacy would rise, these kingdoms would rise, take the papacy down, then they would go out of the way. Then the papacy would come up, they would rise up, and as the papacy went down, they would go down because their work was completed. Now, why did Islam go down in 1840? Why is that a, a key point? Well, like we just mentioned, that the seven trumpets are plagues on the papacy. When did the papacy go down? 1798. So the papacy went down in 1798, so the job of Islam at that time had been completed for a time, so then they went down shortly thereafter. Now, if we think about that, those are only the first two woes, the fifth and the sixth trumpet. So the second woe, or the sixth trumpet, ended in 1840. Now we know from a study of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that the papacy again will rise up and it'll be the head of all the, what we would call the new world order. They will be the kingdom over all the kingdoms. And we see that rise slowly but surely and getting more rapid as the days go by. So if this papacy is going to rise to power again, could we then maybe see the Muslim power rise again? Because the third woe hasn't happened yet. Now, <clears throat> why haven't you heard about this topic? Why haven't you heard about the importance of the seven trumpets? And why are you hearing about it now? We're going to talk a little bit about this. Because it's not some just spurious understanding. Ellen White mentioned it, all the pioneers taught it, and it was in the Adventist Quarterly right up until the 1940s that this was the understanding. And now we're going to go back a little bit. Who knows Louis F. Weir? Very popular author. Uh, it's in, he's, his books and articles are in, all, in most uh, Adventist seminaries. He has a book called The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message. And he's passed away now. And his views are one of the most common views that is being taught right now on prophecy, on different doctrines, and things like this. Now, I want to go through uh, some of what he says in his book, The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message, because we know that Revelation 14 is of most importance right now, the three angels' messages. So this is from his book on page 8, and he wrote this book in the 1940s. The following pages set forth some of the principles of prophetic interpretation which are necessary to a proper grasp of present truth. So he's saying that we need to follow certain principles so that we can understand prophecy and present truth correctly. <clears throat> Page 22. Especially in the study of the prophecies, one needs to apply all the laws of interpretation, the fairy to failure, to learn and to apply these laws is responsible for a great amount of theological confusion and false teaching regarding last day events. The Bible is scientifically constructed. There are certain principles upon which it was written, and those who interpret it without regard to these principles do injustice to its divine author. Only when these principles are recognized and applied will a beautiful harmony be found to exist in all its parts. Now, I agree with most of his statement, except for the part of 
the scientificness of it. Because do you remember when we read, Ellen White said that there's going to be people coming who are saying that the Bible is interpreted through science. So this gave me a red flag. Then on pages 26 and 27, in the plan of redemption, Jesus is the visible manifestation of the deity to man. And because of this, the New Testament reveals the principle that the literal interpretation of Scripture are applicable when and where his literal presence is manifested. In the days of literal Israel, in heaven now, in the eternal kingdom on earth. Wherever Jesus is, there will be found literal, real, and tangible. So he's saying only where Jesus actually physically shows up do you interpret it as literal. In dealing with national Israel, God spoke audibly to his people, and the evidences of his presence were literally seen by them. When, the earth, uh, when on the earth, Jesus, sorry, I'm having trouble here. When, when on earth, Jesus was literally seen. But with his death, the period in which God revealed himself through literal things, temples, priests, sacrifice, etc., ended. And the dispensation of the Holy Spirit was ushered in. During this dispensation of the Holy Spirit, the things of the kingdom of grace are based upon the spiritual and the invisible. Jesus declares, even the spirit of truth, whom the word cannot receive, because it seeth him not. In the days of literal Israel, things were grouped on a literal national basis. In the times of spiritual Israel, things are spiritually grouped together. Jerusalem, which was God's center, and Babylon, Satan's center, and all that were grouped with them are brought into the New Testament and applied in a spiritual, worldwide sense. The principle of the literal wherever Jesus is and the spiritual now, while the Holy Spirit represents Jesus, gives rise to the principle of the triple application of the scriptures, whereby the things related to Israel on earth after the cross and the subsequent rejection of the Jewish nation. Literal after the second advent, this triple application establishes the certainty of the three angels' message. So that maybe was a little bit confusing, but what he's saying is, if Jesus isn't physically there, then we have to interpret everything on a spiritual worldwide sense. Now I have a couple problems with that, because one of William Miller's principles and the things that Ellen White said, is that the prophecies have a literal historic fulfillment, not a spiritual application. So we need to be looking for historic events, not events or no events. Because when you're talking about spiritual, it's not a physical thing that's happening anymore. But also, when you think about this, so he's saying it was literal in the Old Testament. But when we go back to the Old Testament, can a dead lamb actually take away your sins? No. Who was the real sacrifice for our sins? Jesus. So was the lamb the actual literal sacrifice for our sin? No, it was a type. So literal things are happening, but they're types. Just like in the prophecies now, we see the 1260 days, we see a beast, but that beast is interpreted as a literal thing, a literal kingdom that has literal events connected to it. And it doesn't seem like a big difference right now, but the effects of this you'll see go a lot farther. The book of Revelation is a divine example of this principle of things being grouped together. For all the places, proper names, and designations are employed symbolically. But this group principle, we know that as Babylon in Revelation 16 is interpreted spiritually, so the Euphrates and Armageddon, which are grouped with her, must also be interpreted in a spiritual worldwide sense. 
So he's just saying that everything now in Revelation has to have a spiritual meaning and can have no literal historical event connected to it. And you can go read his book yourself, so don't take my word for it. You can go read it and you can see what he's saying. The New Testament reveals the principle of spiritually discerning spiritual things. In the historical narratives of the Old Testament, in this way God hath revealed them unto us, the things which he hath prepared for them that love him. The natural eye does not see these things, sorry, does not see these spiritual things, and often interprets literally that which should be spiritually discerned. Now, when we say that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, that doesn't mean that they don't have a literal fulfillment because everything in the Bible has been written spiritually because it's from the Spirit of God. But they, in turn, have a literal fulfillment or we have no way marks anymore. We don't know when the 1260 year starts. We don't know when it ends. And he said, since Jesus went to heaven, the things on earth are all spiritual, which we know right away that that gives us a problem. First Selected Messages, page 29. To some of the questions you have asked, I am not to answer yes or no. I must not make statements that can be misconstrued. I see and feel the peril of those who I have been instructed are endangering their souls at times by listening to deceptive representations regarding the messages that God has given me. So she's saying she even fears to write on certain topics because someone may twist her writings. Through many twistings and turnings and false reasonings on what I have written, they try to vindicate their personal unbelief. I am sorry for my brethren who have been walking in the midst of suspicion and skepticism and false reasoning. I know that some of them would be blessed by messages of counsel if the clouds obscuring their spiritual vision could be driven back and they could see aright. But they do not see clearly. Therefore, I dare not communicate with them. Which is sad because she was fearing writing on certain topics because they would be misconstrued. Now, Louis F. Weir actually has his own set of rules, 13 principles of interpretation. Now, not all the rules are bad, but when you have a little bit of error and a lot of truth, that's how the devil starts to get things worked in. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 204. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the suppositions that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this, were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be as counted as error. And this is the concern. When we start to change little things, little rules, little ways that we are interpreting and saying that the way that God led us in the past is no longer the way that God led us, then our religion is going to end up being entirely different than what it was originally. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and the storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Now we're going to look at 
a thesis that was written by the Adventist church, and this was a case study. And basically what it did, it's called From Clear Fulfillment to Complex Prophecy, the history of the Adventist interpretation of Revelation 9 from 1833 to 1957, because this is the range in where we went from the old view to the new view. So what they did was they took all the different interpretations and put them chronologically together, and it's quite a long document, and you can read through and see how the understanding shifted and where it shifted. So this is from page 103. In 1945, Louis F. Weir, an Australian minister and author, published a book entitled The Certainty of the Third Angel's Message, where he laid out a set of hermeneutical principles in the defense of a more symbolic and spiritual interpretation of prophecy. This is what was not how Adventism was founded. It was historical continuum, literal interpretation of prophecy. Though he adhered to the traditional view of Revelation 9, later scholars agreed with his reinterpretation of the Euphrates and Armageddon in Revelation 16 and much of his hermeneutics and applied them not only to the first four trumpets but to the fifth and sixth one as well. So because of his new rules that he introduced, that is what paved the way to start reinterpreting all of Revelation. And now we have, and, and we're to the point, where the BRI has said that we no longer think that the papacy is the beast in Revelation 13. This is from the abstract. Seventh-day Adventist originally agreed on the meaning of Revelation 9 and regarded it as a very important prophecy. Whereas today, there is no consensus on this prophecy, which is regarded as both complex and non-vital. So we went from it being a very foundational pillar because it was a physical, historical event. August 11, 1840. It was predicted before it happened. And now it is all of a sudden non-vital. This is from page 51. This is where it gets scary. Ellen White mentioned August 11, 1840 as one of the fulfillments of prophecy that occurred during the Advent movement. So they acknowledge that Ellen White said it was a fulfillment. The fact that she did so was to most Adventists the divine seal of approval on the Seventh-day Adventist interpretation of Revelation 9. Since White was perceived by the denomination and herself as the Lord's inspired messenger to his end-time church. Now, this is the, the Adventists are the ones who did this uh, abstract. So this isn't some, another denomination talking about Adventism. This is Adventism talking about Adventism. And they're saying that she was just perceived. We need to have the commandments and the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. If we start questioning that Ellen White was a messenger given to the Adventist church, then we have no message. Later on, however, more and more members questioned whether it was correct to use her writings as proof for a particular interpretation of prophecy. Since she had neither claimed to infallibility, nor had she claimed to be an author on history. So Ellen White wasn't a historian. So maybe we should take the liberty to reinterpret these things. The discussion on how to correctly understand her single two-paragraph mention of Revelation 9 continues to this day in Seventh-day Adventist theological circles and involves the ongoing discussion of the nature and role of prophetic interpretation. Well, they said this topic is important and interesting, but it lies outside the confines of this thesis. So they just kind of said, well, we aren't going to cover this right now. But this is dangerous. If we start thinking that we can go back and go against the messages that we were given 
then where is it going to end? So if we take what we think is not important now, Revelation 9, and we remove that, and then we say, well, Revelation 13 is really harsh, so maybe we should take away that. And then we say, well, you know, the sanctuary message, most of the evangelicals say he went uh, straight into the most holy after he, he left earth. Well, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do this. And it's not going to end, and it'll end up being an organization that we can't even recognize. Great Controversy, page 598 and 599. The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who with a pretense of great wisdom teach that the scriptures have a mystical and secret, what did she say? Spiritual meaning. Not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. So should we be thinking that the prophecies have a spiritual, mystical interpretation? No. They have a literal, historical continuum fulfillment. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, Ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. But we want to be the originator of new ideas. We want to be the next famous preacher who come out with this amazing interpretation. But unfortunately, it's different than what they had previously, which is okay, it's not that bad, but, you know, maybe they didn't have the full light on the subject. This is very dangerous. There's a big difference between studying and learning more that builds on the foundation to complete a house than tearing the whole foundation out from under it. We should exhort all the powers of the mind in the study of the scriptures and should task the understanding to comprehend as far as mortals can the deep things of God. Yet we must not forget that the docility and submission of a child is the true spirit of the learner. Scriptural difficulties can never be mastered by the same methods that are employed in grappling with philosophical problems. We should not engage in the study of the Bible with that self-reliance with which so many enter the domains of science, which is exactly what Louis F. Weir said, but with a prayerful dependence upon God and sincere desire to learn His will. We must come with a humble and teachable spirit to obtain knowledge from the great I Am. Otherwise, evil angels will so blind our minds and harden our hearts that we shall not be impressed by the truth. If we allow these sophistries, these subtle changes to come in and we accept them and we don't test the spirit by which they're coming from, then we're going to more and more be susceptible to deception. Now, I want to just make a point. It's, it's, it's not a direct point necessarily to say that it's wrong. But Louis F. Weir was actually disfellowship, and he had his pastoral membership taken away the year before he wrote the book, Certainty of the Third Angel's Message. So he actually wasn't a pastor anymore when he wrote these, and he never was for the rest of his life. After he died, then somehow... Teachers of a new spirit said that we should start reading some of these books and brought them into the colleges and into the universities and introduced these theories, and that is how this started to build up. Just like you've seen in the abstract, from clear fulfillment to complex 
non-important prophecy. Many a portion of scripture which learned men pronounce a mystery or pass over as unimportant is full of comfort and instruction to him who has been taught in the school of Christ. So Revelation 9 is now understood as unimportant. But when we understand the real interpretation, it should be a comfort because God doesn't allow the papacy or any of the evil powers to go unchecked. God only allows them to go as far as he allows them to go. And that is the same for what will happen. There is a Sunday law coming, there's events coming, but God is going to only allow them to go as far as he wills. One reason why many theologians have no clear understanding of God's word is they close their eyes to truths which they do not wish to practice. An understanding of Bible truth depends not so much on the power of intellect brought to the search as on the singleness of purpose, the earnest longing after righteousness. In, this is from uh, Great Controversy, page 521. In order to sustain erroneous doctrines and unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of Scripture separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as provide, proving their point, when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the opposite. And unfortunately, I've seen some very popular present truth preachers take the Bible and Ellen White quotes. I was watching a sermon one time. I won't say who it was or what it was, but it was on a certain topic. And they brought up some Ellen White quotes. And I said, wow, I never heard of these Ellen White quotes. This, like, am I going to have to rethink this? So then I went and looked up the quotes that they were mentioning. And I looked up the reference, and they weren't there. And so I was like, okay, there's a problem. So then I looked up the words that they were using and trying to find the quotes. And then I found them. And the problem was they only quoted a sentence. The whole paragraph said exactly opposite of what the preacher was trying to say. If he read the whole, the whole paragraph, his whole sermon would have been annulled because it went exactly against what his point was. But this is the danger. We listen to a sermon where someone throws out spirit of prophecy, they throw out Bible quotes, and we never go to check what it is in context. Another time, we were doing some studies at AD uh, with some of the staff, and we were going through Revelation and Daniel, and we were going with uh, the book Last Day Events from Ellen White. Last Day Events is a compilation. So we're using that, and then we started noticing that there were some really strange things being said. It was saying that certain things were going to happen on certain of the plagues, and then certain events were all mixed up, and we couldn't understand what was going on. So then we went, and we looked up each of the paragraphs and last day events in their original source. And we noticed that the titles were changed. So when it said that this and this and this would happen at this time, that paragraph was talking about a totally another event in history, totally different time frame, sometimes 2,000 years apart. Because they went and they changed the titles, changed the reference, and they put multiple paragraphs together from different places and made it seem like it was from one selection. So when we're studying, we want to make sure that we're reading from the original source. So when we're looking at like the conflict series, that's an original source. The Great Controversy, original source. Testimonies, original source. Signs of the Times, Review and Herald. These are original sources. And some of the compilations are good. They're good for quick reference, but we have to be checking, is this in context? Because man is putting different headers for what they think it should apply for. Whenever the study of the scriptures, actually, I didn't finish that quote. With the cunning of the serpent, they entrench themselves behind dis connected utterances construed to suit their carnal desires. 
Thus do many willfully pervert the word of God. Others who have an active imagination seize upon the figures and symbols of holy writ, interpret them to suit their fancy with little regard to the testimony of Scripture as it is its own interpreter. And then they present their vagaries as the teachings of the Bible. Whenever the study of the scriptures is entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, the plainest and simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. This is why we have to come to the Bible with the respect and humility, not trying to prove our own point. Sorry, could I get a, a water, please? <coughs> The papal leaders select such portions of Scripture as best serve their purpose, interpret to suit themselves, and then present these to the people. While they deny them the privilege of studying the Bible and understanding its sacred truths for themselves. The Holy Bible should be given to the people just as it reads. It should be better for them not to have a Bible instruction at all than to have the teaching of the Scriptures thus grossly misrepresented. So we know during the Dark Ages, they physically chained the Bible in the church so that people couldn't read it and learn from God directly. Excuse me. So then what they did, because the Bibles aren't chained in, in the churches anymore, they changed the Bible, like we've seen the other night. They remove passages, they change the verses, they change the meaning. So now they have a Bible that they can give to everybody, but it's just not the one that it actually has the truth in it. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 194. Satan and his angels are making every effort to obtain control of minds, that men may be swayed by falsehood and pleasing fables. Are our physicians lifting the danger signal? Are the men who have been placed in prominent positions in our sanitariums lifting the danger signal? Or are many of the watchmen asleep? While mischievous tongues and acute minds, sharpened by long practice in evading the truth, are continually at work to bring in confusion and to carry out plans instigated by the enemy. <clears throat> this is from the Retirement Years, page 21. The messages that we have received from heaven are true and faithful. When the man strives to bring in new theories which are not the truth, the ministers of God should be clear warning against these theories, pointing out where, if received, they would lead the people of God. Those who have received the light of present truth should not, should not be easily deceived and readily led from the true path into strange paths. The watchmen are to be wide awake to discern the outcome of all spacious reasoning. For serious errors will be brought in to lead the people of God astray. Who knows what the word specious means? I didn't know what that word meant when I read it the first time. It's something that seems plausible and reasonable, but is actually error. So a lot of these theories, Revelation 9, others, seem reasonable, they seem plausible, they make sense according to science and psychology, but according to the Bible, it's not true. And that's the thing that we have to realize that when we're studying the Bible, we can't just use human reasoning. If we go to Daniel and we start interpreting the prophecy and we say, oh, well, this and this and this makes really good sense, that doesn't make it true. It may line up with other things. It may even seem to make sense. But if we're missing parts because we're not following the right principles, then it's not true. (laughs) 
When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who are pioneers in our work speak plainly. And let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of the articles in our periodicals. Gather up the rays of divine light that God has given as he has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. This truth will stand the test and trial. The test of time and trial. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 111. And I know there's a lot of quotes, but I think it's very important that we see the weight of what we're talking about. And I don't want to be just saying it. I want it to be backed up by the Spirit of Prophecy and Ellen White. And you can be the discerner of what is truth. The very same Satan is at work to undermine the faith of the people of God at this time. There are persons ready to catch up every new idea. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation are what? Misinterpreted. These persons do not consider that the truth has been set forth at the appointed time, but the very men whom God was leading to do this special work. These men followed on step by step in the very fulfillment of prophecy. And those who have not had a personal experience in this work are to take the word of God and believe on their word, who have been led by the Lord in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. These messages received and acted upon are doing their work to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God if we search the scriptures to confirm the truth of God, the truth God has given his servants for the world, we shall be found proclaiming the first, second, and third angels' messages. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. So this is from Early Writings, page 48 and 49. I want you to notice what's in blue. The Lord gave me a view, January 26, 1850, which I will relate. I saw that some of the people of God are stupid and dormant, and but half awake. They do not realize the time we are now living in, and that the man with the dirt brush has entered and that some are in danger of being swept away. I begged of Jesus to save them, to spare them a little longer and let them see their awful danger, that they might get ready before it should be forever too late. The angel said, destruction is coming like a mighty whirlwind. I begged of the angel to pity and to save those who loved this world who were attached to their possessions and were not willing to cut loose from them and sacrifice to speed the messengers on their way to feed the hungry sheep who were perishing for want of spiritual food. Have you ever heard in the Bible the term the man with the dirt brush? That's because it's not there. <laughs> so when we're talking about the man with the dirt brush, where does this come from? This actually comes from a dream that William Miller had. And this was not just any dream. This was a prophetic dream. And Ellen White references it because of the importance and the weight that it actually held. It's a very amazing dream. And we're going to try in a short time to go through it. You could take an hour or two hours to dissect this dream. It is so amazing. This is from early writings, and, and you see the importance because in one of Ellen White's first writings, she accounts the dream. So she's showing how important this dream was to her, and then referencing it as Jesus being the man with the dirt brush. So let's read. I dreamed, this is William Miller talking, that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square. So we have William Miller, 
and he's given this casket from God. And this casket is 10 by 6 by 6. Now, if you multiply 10 by 6 by 6, you come to 360. So this is the prophetic principle of day for a year. They understood finally, after 1798, when the prophecies were opened, that what was locking the prophecies of the Bible were this 360-day interpretation. And this casket, we're going to see that this casket represents the Bible. And this casket was made of ebony and pearls curiously inlaid. To the casket, there was a key attached. And we're going to see that these, this key is the rules. Because when you apply the rules to the Bible, it unlocks everything to our understanding. I immediately took the key and opened the casket. When to my wonder and surprise, I found it filled with all sorts and sizes of jewels, diamonds, precious stones, and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value, beautifully arranged in their several places in the casket. And thus arranged, they reflected a light and glory equaled only by the sun. I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliance, beauty, and value of its contents. I therefore placed it on a center table in my room and gave, it out, word, and gave out word that all who had a desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by man in this life. The people began to come in, and at first few in number, but increased to a crowd. When they first looked into the casket, they would wonder and shout for joy. But when the spectators increased, everyone would begin to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and scattering them on the table. I began to think that the owner would require the casket and the jewels again at my hand. And I suffered them to... And, I, and if I suffered them to be scattered, I could never place them in their places in the casket again as before. I felt I should never be able to meet the accountability, for it would be immense. I then began to plead with the people not to handle them, nor to take them out of the casket. But the more I pleaded, the more they scattered. And now they seemed to scatter them all over the room, on the floor and on every piece of furniture in the room. Then I saw that among the genuine jewels and coin, they had scattered an innumerable quantity of spurious jewels and counterfeit coin. I was highly incensed at their base conduct and ingratitude, and reproved and reproached them for it. But the more I reproved, the more they scattered the spurious jewels and false coin among the genuine. Then I became vexed in my physical soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing out one, three more would enter and bring in dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the jewels, diamonds and coin, which they all excluded from sight. They also tore in pieces my casket and scattered it among the rubbish. I thought no man regarded my sorrow or my anger. I became wholly discouraged and disheartened and sat down and wept. So he had this dream of this casket, a beautiful casket, and the people came in and they tore it in pieces and they scattered all the jewels around and he could do nothing about it. While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and accountability, I remembered God and earnestly prayed that he would send me help. Immediately, the door opened, and a man entered the room when, all the pe when the people all left it, and he having a dirt brush, so here's the man with the dirt brush, in his hand opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and rubbish from the room. I cried to him to forbear, for there were some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. He told me, fear not for he would take care of them. Then, while he brushed the dirt and rubbish, 
false jewels and counterfeit coin all rose and went out of the window like a cloud. And the wind carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment. When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold, the silver coin lay scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket, much larger and more beautiful than the former, and gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful, and cast them into the casket till not one was left although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of a pin. So is even the tiniest jewels important? Absolutely. We can't miss one of these principles. And it's interesting. So he had the original casket. And this dream happened early on. And then the casket was torn apart. And then the man with the dirt brush came. And he told him to fear not. Well, we know who that is. And he placed on the table a casket even larger. How would the casket get bigger? So we had the Bible. And then how did the Bible get bigger? The spirit of prophecy was added. So Miller, first when he was studying, he understood the day for a year. And he had the key to unlock the prophecies. And then when he opened up the casket, he's seen all the amazing jewels inside. And then God had to make that casket larger. Because sometimes it's hard for us to see the jewels inside. He then called upon me to come and see. I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with the sight They shone with ten times their former glory. I thought they had been scored in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered them and trod them in the dust. They are arranged in beautiful order in the casket, every one in its place, without any visible pains of the man who cast them in. I shouted with very joy, and that shout awoke me. Are we supposed to, as God's people, give a shout at the end? Because of what? Because of all the jewels that we find in this book? We're supposed to give a loud cry. And that loud cry is supposed to what? Wake up those dry bones. We need to be woken up because we see the beauty of the prophecies and that they're fulfilling right in front of us. Signs of the Times. May 1st, 1901. Christ is the originator of all truth. By the work of the enemy, the precious gems of truth had been torn from their setting and placed in a framework of error. Christ came to replace the jewels of truth in their rightful position. He rescued them from the rubbish of error, gave them a new power, and bade them stand fast forever. He could use these truths with perfect freedom, for he was their author. He had cast them into the minds of each generation, and when he came to the world, he vitalized and rearranged the truth which Satan had robbed of life, clothing them with more than their original freshness and power. He gave them to the world for the benefit of future generations. So we see Ellen White referencing this dream and showing the importance of its fulfillment through our history. That the jewels were taken out of the casket, they were scattered with errors, but the promise is that those jewels are going to be put back in the chest. Child Guidance, page 505. The Word of God abounds in precious jewels of truth. And parents should bring them forth from their casket. So how is she referring to parents' Bibles? A casket. And present them before their children in their true luster. In the word of God, you have a treasure house from which you may draw precious stores. As Christians, you should furnish yourselves for every good work. 
counsels to parents, teachers, and students. Page 421. The Bible is a field where are concealed heavenly treasures, and they will remain hidden until by diligent mining they are discovered and brought to light. What does she say the Bible is? The Bible is a casket containing jewels of inestimable value, which should be so presented as to be seen in their intrinsic luster. But the beauty and excellence of these diamonds of truth are not discerned by natural eye. The lovely things of the material world are not seen until the sun, dispelling the darkness, floods them with its light. And so with the treasures of God's word, they are not appreciated until they are revealed by the sun of righteousness. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 111. It is true that there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled, but very erroneous work has been done again and again and will continue to be done by those who seek to find new light in the prophecies and who begin by turning away from the light that God has already given. The messages of Revelation 14 are those by which the world is to be tested. They are the everlasting gospel and are to be sounded everywhere. But the Lord does not lay upon those who have not had an experience in his work the burden of making a new exposition of the prophecies which he has by his Holy Spirit moved upon his chosen servants to explain. And what did she call William Miller when we were reading in the the quotes before? That he was a chosen servant and that angels came to him to give him the understanding that led him down the delineation of events, these timelines stretching through. Early Writings, page 14. While I was praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. This is Ellen White's first vision. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which the angel told me was what? The midnight cry. So we have, she's seeing the Advent people on this narrow path. This isn't something that has even finished being fulfilled yet. This vision is happening right now. This narrow path going up higher and higher, and the cities on one side, and what's behind them? The midnight cry. So these messages of 1842, 43, and 44 is the light that was behind them, giving them the ability to walk. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary and said the city was a great way off, and they expected to have entered it before. Do we not say that? We think that Jesus should have come already. People have been saying that for a long time. Well, you know, uh, my grandparents said to move in the country, or my great-grandparents, and it's not happened, so is it that urgent? Maybe he's going to take a long time still. I have no idea. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm, and from his arm came a light, which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Alleluia. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. 
the light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness. And they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Do you remember when we were reading the other night where it said that there's a bunch of people on the wide road and they even have on their, their shirt dead to the world and they thought they're so holy and everybody around them saying, well, how are you so holy? We're on the same path. You look the same, you dress the same, you talk the same, you eat the same. And they said, no, but I have a sad countenance and I get excited when present truth is preached. Soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus coming. So when is this dream actually being fulfilled? Still coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. When God spoke the time, he poured upon us the Holy Ghost, and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. So this vision... This people who's walking on the path is the 144,000. And she says that's Adventist. So that should be a hint to us when we're studying the 144,000 that this is not just people from all churches. This is people who have the message because what was the light behind them? The midnight cry. And the other churches don't have the midnight cry. They denied the midnight cry. These are people who understand the messages of 1842 to 44. Now, what was the midnight cry? Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, Go ye out to meet him. This was the midnight cry. This message that we need to be ready for the imminent approach of Jesus. The message hasn't changed since 1844. It doesn't matter how much time is going to go by. The prophecies don't change. The truth doesn't change. The message doesn't change. It's still the first, second, and third angel's messages. Our message is the same which was to give power to the second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive this message. Angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those entrusted with the cry made haste. And in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. Sometimes we're embarrassed of the disappointment. We shouldn't be embarrassed of our history. We shouldn't be embarrassed of the events that took place that separated us and gave us the special message. It was prophesied in Revelation. This is not something that is a negative thing. In Revelation 10, with the little book, is predicted that this disappointment would happen, that they would eat it, that it would be discouraging. But this was the starting of the sifting. In the year 1844, 1844 there was 50,000 people waiting for Christ to come. After October 23 rolled around and he didn't come, that went all the way down to 50. From 50,000 people down to 50. And only 50 were left that said, we need to get back to our Bible and study where we went wrong. The rest said, well, 
Jesus probably ain't coming. And they totally disregarded everything. Those entrusted with the cry made haste. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God and his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received this message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This is why we need to be those wise virgins who have the oil in our lamps. And five of them are wise and five foolish. And that word foolish, we learned, was what? Godless. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This is the midnight cry message. The midnight cry message is the message for the ten virgins. If we're to be wise, we must understand these messages. We must understand the three angels' messages, the midnight cry, the full understanding of what separated us as Adventists. And in further series that we'll be filming later, we're going to go through all the different foundations that separated us from the other churches. We didn't have time at this camp meeting to go through step by step, but we'll be going through some of these and clarifying because if we are missing any parts of the foundation, any of the pillars of our faith, then how can we have a solid building? If we start pulling out pillars out of the foundation, the church is going to fall. But fortunately, we're told that the church will never fall and that these jewels are going to be put back in the casket. We need to find what these other jewels were that were scattered. Because after this time, when Ellen White references the time of the midnight cry, she references it as one of the most miraculous times. And so does Revelation when it talks about the churches, the church of Philadelphia, brotherly love. They were all unified. They all understood the doctrine. And then this scattering of the jewels took place. We need to be asking God, like William Miller did, I need help to find these jewels again, because it's hard to distinguish these false ones from the true ones. We need to ask the man with the dirt brush to come and help get us cleaned up, so that we can see the casket and the jewels put in it in its full brightness. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us all these precious, precious jewels. These truths that when lined up show a perfect chain of historical events so we can see exactly where we are in history. These things are not mystical. These things are not hard to understand. They are given and should be able to be understood by a child. We thank you that you are the man with the dirt brush and you're able to clean out all the rubbish that some of these spurious jewels are getting mixed up in, that the people are bringing in the dirt and trying to scatter your truths, but we know that you will bring them all back. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.